Okay, shows live on my end too. Okay, so this is going to be a debate between Max and Joe on does the Christian God exist. We're going to have a 20 minute opening, 15 minute rebuttal, a 10 minute essentially counter rebuttal, a 5 minute closing, and then it's going to be opened up to Q&A after uh, the debate. So we're going to start now uh, with Max, who's going to take the affirmative. All right, thank you for the introduction. The case for the Christian God. My name is Maximus Confesses. I'll be defending the affirmative position that God does indeed exist. And to demonstrate God's existence, I'm going to show his indispensability for objective morality using a specific formulation of the moral argument called the and some Kantian moral argument. But first, I think it's pertinent to define God. And let's go with the definition of the divine. Um, some X is divine if X is if they are, have the following qualities. The first one is omnipotence. X is omnipotent if and only if, um, the IFF stands for if and only if, by the way, um, there is nothing possible in principle which can thwart, manipulate, or change X. Um, this is more of a negative definition of omnipotence uh, that's more supported in apophatic theology in the work of Anselm, but I think it works much better than um, and is in privy to probably the same criticisms as um, a specific omnipotence such as um, can God create a rock so heavy he cannot lift? Something akin to that. Um, omnibenevolent. X is omnibenevolent if there is no possible greater source for human fulfillment. Hey, Max, I'm really sorry. I know this is probably bad, but we can't see the movement of your slides. Oh, you can't? No. Uh, I think you're presenting and you, you have your window, you have a different window open. Oh, can you see it now? Uh, yeah. You, you go up and down so we can check just in case. And now go down. Perfect. Um, uh -oh. You you're not in a presentation though. It's a uh, like edited format. Oh well, as long as people can see it, that'll be fine. Cool. Yeah, just All make right, sure uh, that you activate the slide that you're reading off of. All right. Sorry about. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I no, guess no. also I'm cool with you getting like a minute too. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Cool. So the next one is omnibenevolent. Some X is omnibenevolent if there's no possible greater source for human fulfillment. Uh, to quote St. Augustine, we long for you, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. The notion is that human nature has has certain things which fulfill it a lot better than other things, of course, but if there is a God, then he should fulfill it greater than any other possible thing. For if he is, true, for if he is the source of all of creation, then he should be the source and he should have the knowledge of what it is that fills us. Which brings us to the next um, property, omniscience. X is omniscient if there is no source of truth outside of himself or his creation. Truth here is not only describing what something is, but also how something ought to be. It's prescriptive as well as descriptive. So, any so for example, a Euclidean triangle has an internal sum of 180 degrees. So anytime I draw a Euclidean triangle, it ought to have it. Um, and the important thing here is because God is the power, the source behind uh, creation, he is also the source of truth in creation itself, and also for himself, by his just own existence. God is also indivisible. X is indivisible if it has no parts that are more basic. In um, immutable. X is immutable if it has no ability to change. It's timeless if it's not temporally extended in four-dimensional space-time. Um, God is not. And it's spaceless if it has no extension. The, thir the uh, third part is perfectly loving. X is perfectly loving if it is merciful to those deserving it. This and last a mind. X is a mind if it can possess truth. God is the source of truth both in himself and in creation. It's the omniscience. Uh, man's, man reasons to truth in a reliable fashion from maintaining correct beliefs. Truth is what corresponds to reality in this case. God is the corresponder to reality. Is ultimately the corresponder linking uh, what 
uh, what is in himself to what ought to be um, in creation. Uh, the next part is worship worthy. X is worthy of worship if we have no justifiable reason not to obey such a being. X is simple. If it is direct, if it is directly the truth maker for all properties. And um, so, for example, to be the truth maker for all your properties. Um, if we look at Socrates, uh, a classical example, Socrates is known to be um, who he is because of who, where he was born, um, his teachings, various accidental properties um, that coalesce. So he gets his properties from uh, participating in his surroundings as the particular being that he is, none of which are really up to him. However, with God, God just ha the divine has um, all its attributes in himself. He's not contingent upon anything else for them. And lastly, a trinity member. X is a member of the trinity if it has all its properties from God innately or by participating in the trinity. Uh, there is one God because there is one trinity of beings with all the aforementioned properties listed above. This brings us to the definition of God as opposed to the divine. Um, the div God, can, uh, God is the trinity and those participating in it are divine. It consists of the Father, Rex is the Father if it is the member of the trinity with all, whom all the other members participate with. Consists of the Son, X is the Son if it is the Son, it participates in the Trinity by way of the Father and is incarnate in Jesus Christ. Christ is both God and man because he shares all the necessary properties of God and creates a state of affairs in nature such that it expresses its divine nature through a particular human form. Um, and lastly, it consists of the Holy Spirit. X is the Holy Spirit if it participates in the Trinity by way of the Father and the Son. What one has to remember here is the term participates is different from being um, is different from being caused uh, in this sense. Uh, platonic objects, if you, one is familiar with Plato's philosophy, he thought that there was this um, universal and all particulars uh, get their essence or form by participating with uh, the universal. So there is the perfect man and then there are various uh, men or human beings. Uh, the father is the divine head in whom the son and the Holy Spirit participate perfectly with. Um, so, and because of this, um, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit can both be considered uh, divine just as God is, just as the Father is divine. So all of them have their divinity from, uh, through, by way of the Father, participating in the Godhead perfectly. Uh, consider for analogy the self. Uh, the self, um, as soon as you have that, there's also the self, self-knowledge. Um, and also self-love. This is the notion of Augustine uh, uses for the Trinity. All, since these members participate with each other perfectly and whatever is perfect has its, um, has its perfection by way of another, then they would also be perfect in possessing and reflecting those same qualities. And the last part is necessarily existent. X is necessarily existent if it's if it uh, existence could not have been otherwise. So now I don't really have to demonstrate God's exist necessary existence here because right now we're only talking about necessity by way of possibility. So he's only possibly necessary. Um, in the same sense, if there's a huge math equation, there's going to be a necessary answer with a lot of possibilities. But whatever is actually the answer is the answer necessarily. So this brings us to the Anselm Kant's moral argument. The argument, just to give a rough sketch, goes as follows. Moral behavior is rational. Moral behavior is only rational if justice will be done. Justice will be done through the atonement by the Christian God. It can only be done through that. And lastly, and therefore, the Christian God exists. Let's take it down premise by premise. Moral behavior is rational. So. From here, we're go I'm going to detail three thought experiments. The first one is the ex thought experiment from expectation. Uh, consider this. Some, some, your parent comes home. 
possessing with them uh, a particular Game Boy. Now, of course, they chose a color, but they really didn't consider what color it would be because you, you are colorblind. That's one scenario. It makes real no. It really does make no sense which color you choose um, for your kid because ultimately you're not going to be able to tell the difference. And the next um, one is you have a family member who comes home and kills somebody in cold blood off the street. Now in the now in both thought experiments, um, one case has uh, a needless decision that was brought up with no expectation. And the other one, it was done, but it feels weird. Nobody kills just for no reason, cold blood. People usually, we, we expect people to behave a certain moral fashion, and when they don't, it kind of gets us in a strange place. Now, consider a, an answer which does have an objective basis in reality. Uh, consider the question 2 plus 2 equals 4. And, of course, we're using... Um, a standard uh, mathematical rule set for arithmetic here. So, um, which one comes closer considering our experience? Um, the first example of the Game Boy analogy or the second one? I think it would be pertinent to just point out that if morality is a rational enterprise, then it should have answers and normative behaviors we should expect from people to be obvious. And I think it meets the criterion much better if we consider morality a form of rational behavior. The next one is from deliberation. So when we deliberate, so when we have an answer to what we ought to do, like consider not so much a morally obvious question, consider one which is highly contestable, um, abortion. Uh, for example, well, it might be easy for some being either massively pro-life uh, or massively pro-choice. For a lot of people, it's something we deliberate on because we think that there is a better suited answer, all things considered. Um, the last one is from the impossibility of subjective meaning and subjective normative behavior, the notion that one can make their own meaning in life. Um, so imagine this. Imagine if uh, Zeus m were to take you to Mount Olympus, and for not believing in Zeus, um, he, sub he subjugates you to a life of excrement eating. So in this scenario, he gives you a choice. You could either be a happy excrement eater who doesn't, um, who doesn't mind eating excrement. In fact, he loves it. Or... Uh, or you could feel all the grossness per, uh, coming out as soon as you eat each piece of finkel matter. So, of course, everyone would probably take the first one. So it seems that in this case, uh, one's passions are deserving of what get, gets you meaning, what you want to do. But consider this, though. Um, consider if uh, you then had the choice from Zeus to either continue eating excrement happily and without cause or without need of any more fulfillment, or you could be, you know, a pianist who has a decent life. He's paid money to do what he loves, but at the same time, he has some unrequited love. He's not always fully happy. If anyone were to choose the life of eating excrement over that, we would consider the um, supposed kindness of Zeus to allow you to uh, not to be happy with that from meaning, not so much a divine gift, but really a gift which was more of a cruel divine joke. So I think it's, I think considering the thought experiments, it would be far more consistent to consider moral behaviors to be a type of rational behavior. The next one is uh, moral, moral behavior is only rational if justice will be done. If if justice, giving people what they deserve, is not done, there is no reason to prefer the moral life over the immoral life. Uh, consider this. Um, consider it raining. You, What we mostly would do would pick up a rain jacket or an umbrella, but imagine if those things did nothing to stop us from getting wet. Uh, this was maybe a form of magical rain that just seeps right through the fabric. 
would any of us really bother bringing an umbrella or a rain jacket anywhere around if they, well, didn't function um, at all? That they got you what? That it was just really a little extra hassle for nothing? No. Likewise, we have a world where um, justice will not be done. Uh, some you have c certain scenarios where um, evil people get away with something. People in power um, aren't called out. They live relatively easy lives, and nothing is done to be accounted for. So there is reason to. So we have now our second premise. There is reason to prefer the moral life or the immoral life. And those w were, of course, the. It's defended from the impossibility of the contrary, but it's also kind of explored in the first premise, because they can't really be a matter of, of uh, subjectivity or just mere preference. So the third premise is justice can only be done through the atonement done by the Christian God. So here we have the Anselmian paradox. How can you repent of your evil with obligations you already owe to God the Father? The Christian answer is you swear allegiance to Christ who serves the Father a necessity of his being, not but uh, not but a supervening obligation uh, that we ourselves have to obey God. He can pay back your moral debt by way of your by way of his nature. Now consider a consider a kingdom that was bankrupt and owes a lot of money to another kingdom. Now obviously they don't have any money or revenue of their own because they don't really have too much access to um, their coffers. So of course, the king, the king of the kingdom that they swear allegiance to, um, he's not too particularly happy. But then he realizes that the kingdom has a princess, and in an old medieval-fashioned way, his son, he sends his son to marry the princess. Now, by way of uh, the marital contract, the princess actually has access to the king's coffers. That's what and, next. Oh, thank you. In the kingdom. Um, she that uh, hers owes money to. Now, all things considered, if since um, she now has access to the money not by way of herself but by way of her marriage, then she can simply access this. Likewise, when Jesus, who owes nothing uh, to God the Father but um, participates in the Godhead fully, uh, comes and he is able to offer a way for us to be uh, put in good standing with God by way of his atonements, we actually have a way out. Uh, we no longer need to rely on ourselves and our own works, which are impossible to live up to when God is perfect, but we have somebody who, uh, through contract, does it for us. And in doing so, uh, we're strongly attached to Christ. Um, he can... Um, his works complete um, our own, and he can stand as our representative in a far closer way than in any other scenario or situation. God, we, on the other hand, if we were to repent, already owing God, then what? Then are we really repenting through ourselves or through God? Because everything we have is is owed through God Himself. So. And other systems I don't really find work. Karma uh, doesn't I find to be hard to work with because it ha it maintains a form of substance dualism or even idealism. But I think science is really attached to a more materialistic view of the of uh, hum of the human body, as am I. Um, naturalism doesn't do this because the universe doesn't care if one way or another. It's blind with indifference. <coughs> other notions of God. <coughs> would have a god who was o willing to overlook evil. Thus, it would be hard to consider such a being all good or just. Lastly, if we have beings who... Lastly, um, there's no interplay like the Trinity has. How can a god be perfectly loving if it has nobody to love? In the Trinity, there is inherent love. Uh, present within that system because there is uh, God the Father and the Son um, who perfectly love love one another and will the good for one another. 
And lastly, there's the Holy Spirit who represents the love between them as well, manifest and doing the will of both. But any kind of Unitarian God, however, just consistent of one person, would have a much harder time because he would need to create to be loving. He would need to create to will the good for somebody else. So with that, I um, end my presentation and I would allocate my time to Joe to start his. Okay, so Joe, now is your 20-minute opening. Yeah, Joe, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that... Uh, am I presenting my... I don't think I am, so let me start again. Everyone can see all right. There you go. Yep. You just went on. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you to agree for. Oh. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Maximus is. Okay. There you go. Go. Uh, you can all see. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for agreeing to this debate, Maximus, and thank you, Cliff, for uh, moderating. Uh, so the title of the debate is "Does the Christian God Exist?" Uh, so really quick. Um, Really quick, I just want to remind everyone that um, that this is my opening speech. Uh, any of the specific points that Maximus made are going to be addressed in my rebuttal period. But I think that in uh, giving my arguments, uh, many of the things that he's mentioned will um, will also be addressed. So this is going to be a great presentation then. All right, so. Let's get some definitions. The Christian God I understand to be an eternal, necessarily existent, non-physical person who created the universe. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good. He f further sacrificed his only son Jesus to save humanity through his death by crucifixion, after which Jesus rose from the dead in accordance with Scripture. Naturalism claims the universe is a closed system in which everything can be explained by natural processes. So there is naturalism, and naturalism is compared to Christianity in my um, presentation. Uh, that slide will be brought up later, or this uh, picture will be brought up later. Uh, I think God's existence entails several claims about the world that naturalism does not. If our observations show these claims to be false or inaccurate, God's existence is disconfirmed. In particular, if God exists, then three things are true. One, Christianity is better, uh, Christianity better explains things about the world than naturalism. Two, non-resistant non-believers do not exist. And three, pointless evil does not exist. I'll argue that the evidence utterly fails to support, to support these claims and so stands as strong evidence against God's existence. Furthermore, naturalism's ability to more accurately explain the evidence that we do see in the world renders God's existence even more unlikely. All right. Uh, so let's look at that first claim. If God exists, then Christianity better explains things about the world. Uh, the, or it better explains things about the world than naturalism. However, this claim is contradicted by a profound historical trend in explanations. Over time, Christian explanations about the world have all been supplanted by naturalistic explanations. Disease was once linked to sin, which angered God, who sought to punish us accordingly. 
But as our understanding about the world accumulated, Christian explanations gave way to naturalistic ones. Sin gave, uh, gave way to the more explanatory germ theory. In fact, the direction of discovered explanations unflinchingly heads to a single direction, towards naturalism and away from Christianity. We have never seen a reversal towards God's existence either. Think about it. There's never been a time when someone said, oh wait, that happened because God wanted demons to do it. Or that happened because angels were sent by God to tell people this or that. Um, the success of naturalism over Christianity is a major theme I will be hammering home for the rest of the debate. Because many other Christian explanations are false, inaccurate, or rendered useless in some instances. For example, if God exists, then the mind can survive the death of the physical brain, and there exists at least one non-physical mind already called God. However, 200 years of neuroscience happen, uh, maintains that if the mind isn't a brain, then it is highly dependent on the functioning of the brain. When parts of the brain are damaged, so are parts of the mind. When the brain dies, so does the mind. As our understanding of the mind-body problem grows, the existence of a soul or God's status as a disembodied mind becomes increasingly divorced from the more informative empirical evidence that the mind depends on the brain. So let's move on to the next claim. Uh, if the Christian God exists, then scripture affirms he's unsurpassably loving and desires that all behaviorally and emotionally amiable people accept the gospel message, that he sacrificed his only son to save humanity. Christianity contends that in so doing, uh, such people are able to develop a personal relationship with God, one which he desires as well. Yet when we look at the world population, it is clear that only a minority of all the behaviorally and emotionally amiable people accept the gospel message and believe God exists, which is important if we're to develop a personal relationship with God. And one which he desires as well. Weighing against God's existence are all those reasonable, blameless people who John Schellenberg names non-resistant non-believers. These are people who, for reasons beyond their control, do not believe that God exists, and so never develop the relationship that God desires, even though they are completely open to forming such a relationship. Because non-resistant non-believers do exist, it follows that God does not exist. This is one of the strongest arguments against God's existence and has yet to receive any persuasive challenge, challenges from theists, let alone Christian theists. The strength of the hiddenness argument lies in the following things. It, entails about, it lies in the following things it entails about the world, i.e. the different types of non-resistant non-believers like former believers, ex-theists who were open to becoming best friends with God but found evidence of his existence shallow, or lifelong seekers, people seeking a spiritual port in the storm of religious confusion who are also open to being God's BFF if that's where their supernatural journey concludes. However, many of these guys seek sincerely but fail to find. Another category of non-resistant non-believers are converts to non-theistic religions, sincere seekers who instead found a numinous in polytheisms like Hinduism, Taoism, and even paganism, just like our friend Ocean. And there are isolated, um, there are what are called isolated uh, non-theists. Due to things beyond their control, these people are intellectually or geographically isolated from accessing the gospel message. These people clearly exist and have existed as long as our species has existed. 
So if God exists, then these non-resistant non-believers should not exist. If Max's God exists, then our friend Ocean should not exist. Yet Ocean does exist, and so do these other non-resistant non-believers. Therefore, God does not exist. Before moving on to the next claim, I'll quickly mention one glaring problem the hiddenness argument creates for the Christian God's existence that hopefully Max will address in his rebuttal period. Um, this is uh, the argument from the demographics of theism. In sum, objections to the hiddenness argument that I just presented um, do not account for the lopsided geographic distribution of theistic belief across the world. For example, at least 80% of Americans are theists, while most of Thailand are not. Why are over 250 million Americans seemingly more equipped to develop a relationship with God, while 60 million Asians are not? In fact, the demographics of theism make no sense in light of God's existence. Whereas on naturalism, they make perfect sense. On naturalism, theism crops up in different areas for different cultural, geographical, and even ecological reasons. Saudi Arabia, for example, is another theistic uh, nation that does have 95% of its population confessing theists. But that makes sense on naturalism because it's a country that has a political um, system known as a theocracy. The final claim is that if God exists, then there would be no pointless evil. Free will might let some evil occur, but natural evils would not occur. Things would ultimately be just. But if we look at the world, lots of pointless evil does exist, making it highly unlikely that God exists. Consider animal suffering. Animals have been maiming, killing, and eating each other in a myriad of horrendous fashions, ranging from poisoning to disemboweling to cannibalizing one another for hundreds of millions of years to no apparent purpose and with no end in sight. And natural evil is one among other notable evils, such as... Uh, Evils of natural disasters, like hurricanes and tsunamis. Extreme moral evils, like the evils committed by Stalin or Pol Pot. The evil that is our crappily designed bodies. For example, the female birth canal is not big enough to accommodate a newborn infant's head, resulting in the countless maternal deaths during childbirth, which killed unknown numbers of mothers for at least 200 thousand years. If God existed, then such evils seem pointless. How did the death of a mother during childbirth 200,000 years ago build someone's character, or, for example? Furthermore, such pointless evil makes sense on naturalism, which expects such evil to arise as a consequence of our living on a chaotic planet um, that's at the whim of naturalistic laws. If God exists, the narrow birth canal for women makes no sense because God could have made women with larger birth canals, whereas naturalism expects that the birth canal structure um, ex um, exists as an ancestral morphological trait because the advantage of our having larger brains outweighed the painful disadvantages of a more brutal childbirth. Evolution is a slow process especially in terms of morphological changes, and it doesn't care about our pain and suffering. Related to the previous argument is Stephen's, Stephen Law's Evil God Challenge, which A, is more easily articulated defense, which is a more easily articulated defense against the theodicies, which are counters to the um, evidential problem of evil. And B, it helps focus the debate on the more substantial arguments for and against the Christian God. Now, what if Max was defending instead an all-powerful, all-knowing, 
perfectly evil God instead of a perfectly good God? Couldn't I just reverse my last argument and run it against evil God? Does the problem of good defeat evil God? Just look around you. The world is bursting with good. Why does evil God let brownies or Downton Abbey exist? Why would evil God let parents love their kids? Evil God hates love. He hates kids too. Now cue, now cue the um, evil. Um, okay. Now cue the evil God apologist with his own theodicies. You see, evil God gave us free will because evil chosen freely without a coercion is even more deliciously evil. An evil God loves delicious evil. What if our finite, or the other um, argument could be, what if our finite brains just can't understand evil God's plan? Some pointless goods today might actually set up for a lot, of, a lot more evil in the future. We shouldn't presume to know the mind of evil God. Evil God moves in mysterious ways after all. This is the position of skeptical theism, and it seems even more weak when it's used to um, defend evil God, which is a deity we would all agree that's absurd. Uh, so this that's is the, minutes, Joe. Oh, cool. Thank you. So this is the evil God challenge, which takes all the theodicies to the evidential problem of evil and reverses them into theodicies, theodicies the evil god apologists could use to defeat the problem of good. Again, almost all arguments given against the problem of evil can be mirrored and ultimately protect the existence of an evil god. If the evil god can be defended in a way mirroring theistic defenses of good god, then why is it more reasonable to suppose that a good god exists over an evil god? And arguments from uh, motion or first causes are against or against actual infinities are theistically neutral arguments. They seem irrelevant in a debate about whether the Christian gods exist, which from, I'm interested to know if, uh, if Maximus agrees with that, since he only presented uh, the Anselmian uh, Kantian argument from moral objectivity. So, one last uh, very quick, nice and pithy argument against God's existence is if we have no good reasons to think God exists, then that's a good reason to think that God um, to think that God does not exist. This is clear given the case I just presented. Why is it? So in sum, uh, I've presented powerful arguments against God's existence, the mind-body problem, divine hiddenness, plus the demographics of theism, the evidential problem of evil, plus the evil God challenge, and the lack of any good reasons to believe in God to begin with. These arguments cannot be ignored by Max if he wants to, um, if he wants his God to make sense after this debate. And they are even more devastating when coupled with the success of naturalism, which gives a more accurate explanation of the things we do see about the world. If Max wants, uh, wants to maintain that God exists, he must tear down all of my arguments and hope that his case is able to survive my challenges. Unless and until he does that, I maintain that God does not exist. Um, so... Before, so I can end my last two minutes by briefly uh, making uh, Max's case relevant to my own. Uh, again, Max's specific points will be covered in my rebuttal, but here I'll point out that some general issues with his case don't make sense. Um, I feel that there are several uh, important tenets of the Christian God that 
that Marx needs to address in order to make the Christian God make sense. If you look at the Nicene Creed, which Max referred me to in order to better define God in my preparation for this debate, it explicitly says that Jesus rose bodily from the from the dead in accordance with scripture. But Max hasn't really presented this in his uh, presentation. And if that's so, I'm not sure why he isn't going to support a central tenet of of his uh, Christian God. The other issue is I think that uh, Max needs to explain a bit more why uh, only God is possible for for this kind of moral um, objectivity. I also think that if he wants to maintain the definition that he presented, which so far I don't see any conflicts with the definition I presented, then he needs to address the mind-body problem especially because it's clear that God exists uh, without a body and the mind-body problem shows that anything, any consciousness or any mind cannot exist without dependence on a functioning physical body. Um, I also want to end by saying any um, arguments that for God's existence, ultimately they fall away to the success of naturalism. Any kind of doubt on uh, any arguments usually will eventually have naturalistic explanations. And I feel that strongly helps in showing that God does not exist. Thank you. Okay, that was Joe's 20 minutes opening. And now, Max, are you ready for your 15 minute first rebuttal? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, and you can start. Awesome. So the first, so there were pretty good objections there. Um, the first one was naturalism does more to demonstrate and explain the natural world than God does. Well, this is actually not a surprise on Christianity. In fact, it's expected. In Christianity, as has been for our theology, we believe that God cre creates a world whereby there are certain rules and general tendencies that govern uh, the world around us. And of course, uh, because of this, the world works in a system that doesn't require God's supervenience all the time. In fact, this is one of the reasons why science blossoms so well in the Christian West as opposed to um, the Middle East and Islam. In Islam, there was a period of time where um, they did think very similar to how Christians think of it. In fact, there was a certain school in Islam called the Falsafa School. Uh, or the philosophy school inspired by the notion of how the natural world works according to Aristotle and Plato adapted by various thinkers like Averroes and Avicenna. Now of course this gave way to the Kalam school and people like Al-Ghazali instead believed that causation was merely the work of God in all things. Birds do not fly but for the will of God. Um, everything that works in creation is directly a cause of God all the time. There is no um, efficient cause but God just doing it all. Now if one was to think that was the case, yes, that would be reason to think that God would be a better explanation than natural models. But because the natural world works in accord with the mind of God insofar as its own natural ability, then naturalism has its own um, powers that are granted by God but aren't always induced or pushed. And because of this, um, there are two levels of causation. There's God being the primary cause and sustainer of the world, but there's also the world itself working according to its own rules, laws, and powers uh, that are granted or allowed by God. And in fact, in the past, we have had the uh, occasionalist school overtake the more traditional and naturalistic Aristotelian school in Christian Europe, funny enough. Um, people like Malbranche, uh, taking cue from René Descartes, held that the world itself was just a huge mechanical machine. It functioned on its own, it wasn't sustained by God because it didn't need to be, and of course um, this was the belief of Newton and Descartes, but 
Mel Bronze took it to the other extreme to solve the Monty Biden problem when he said it was a machine where all its gears function in accord with God being the cause behind each and every function and cause. So, on this view, it was actually the occasional school that overtook the Aristotelian school, which was far more naturalistic. So there's actually one case we have where um, a more overarching God being the head governor and absolute controller of everything um, position overtook the traditional Aristotelian position. And it was actually this that made way for the natural sciences as we now know them in contemporary physics where everything is a Newtonian machine. Although um, this has been challenged of late uh, thanks to Einstein and then later on with quantum mechanics. But still, at least it's one case where I could easily point that out. So that's not a big deal, at least as I see it. As to the body-mind problem, I would actually agree with most modern science and say that the body, is, that the mind is indeed uh, a biological construct. I am a pure physicalist um, in that sense. Uh, I won't get into any explanation how I see it, but I'll put myself in the physicalist camp for now. As for what can be considered a mind though, just because there are physical minds doesn't exclude the notion that there are um, other minds which are not physical, immaterial minds for example. And in what sense uh, do we call the minds though? Well, first we have to actually distinguish uh, something between type and token identity. I believe the mind is, when we say mind or brain activity or any specific, uh, say anything specific about the mind, or speaking about token identities. To understand the difference, um, the name Cliff, which is the name of our moderator, is spelled C-L-I-F-F. -F. If I were to ask some two people how, how many letters were there in his name, most people would say, well, there's obviously five. Although, you could also argue that there's four. How? Simple. Uh, people who say that there's five would point that in his name um, there are five instances of letters, C-L-I-F-F. -F. Other people would say, well, yeah, but really we only need to count F once because it's just considered a type of letter. So the token identity, identity theorist would say that, some, that uh, any form of identity in the brain isn't a perfect or complete match, but rather they are just relative instances. Um, so for example, some, a pain in my foot is going to generate very different neural activity than a uh, pain in my heart or pain in my chest or any other kind of pain. Um, in fact, the, so not each instance of feeling pain corresponds to a specific neural firing in the brain. Likewise, there could be other creatures who have very different kinds of intellects. Uh, consider um, an alien who's purely gaseous. We wouldn't exclude the notion just because everyone who's had a brain so far has been just some has been a solid being. Likewise, we would um, artificial intelligence relies upon a certain form of intelligence being realized that does not um, have any neural firings whatsoever. So in, in that case, just because one needs a, so in that case, if we accept token identity, then we don't really identify what is a mind based on what its makeup or biology is. In fact, I did earlier give uh, an example of what one ought to consider a mind, and that was to, just looking back on it, if it can possess truth. So. Um, so I don't really take that to be much of a challenge. Um, the argument from divine hiddenness, geographic evil, the evidential problem of evil, and animalistic problem of evil, I think all have pretty much the same answer, which is the classical response to the problem of evil. Generally, the free will response takes into account something, a secret premise, which is if God is good, then he ought to prevent all suffering insofar as it is possible. Um, in fact, he's obliged to do so, if, because that's what his goodness depends on. But classical theism notes that God himself is goodness. There is nothing over and above him commanding him to do something, nor is there some kind of virtue that he needs to fulfill by way of, sim 
um, by way of acting in a proper manner like we do. So in that case, if those are the two ways to encourage, then to encourage goodness in us, that need to be. It doesn't need to be for God. He is His own goodness. Um, so how? So let's take the traditional uh, problem of evil, which is the Epicurean uh, trilemma. Now it, it tends to go like this: If God is good. If God does not have the will to stop evil, then he's not benevolent. If God does not have the power to stop evil, then he's not all-powerful. If God does have both will and power to prevent evil, how can there be evil? Uh, to further break this down to analogy, if I walk down the street and see a woman being beaten and do nothing about it, then there are problems. One, on the one hand, I might not be strong enough to stop it. I could still be good for trying to do something about it, but I am not strong enough. On the other hand, let's say I can stop it with a simple push of a button, but I just don't care enough to. Such a person we would rightfully call uncaring, uncompassionate, and morally flawed. But if we would like to say that a person is both powerful enough to stop it and good enough to will it to stop happening, how can such a thing take place? Likewise, God is supposed to be all-powerful and all-good. So, um, how do we go about solving it? Well, let's most people solve it um, by addressing the third trilemma. A horn. If God is both willing and powerful, how can there be evil? Most well, usually in line with the free will defense, by saying, well, there are just some things that are just logically impossible, and then just feign to uh, skeptical theism. Well, we don't know how, but it just is. The classical theist, on the other hand, should, uh, rather than do this, say, um, should actually define one of the other premises. If God does not have the will to stop evil, then he is not benevolent. Not the case. God does not have any obligation to stop evil once it happens, because his goodness isn't dependent upon stopping it, nor is he commanded to. So that would actually be the horn that I would attack. And with that in mind, how do we relate this to the premises of the other problems? Well, these are evils, no doubt about it. Uh, the, there's the geographic problem of there's the animal problem of evil, the geographic problem, the evidential the divine hiddenness argument, which I consider just to be a variant of it. Um, by the way, J.L. Schellenberg, fun fact, was actually my university professor. Um, so my response would just be to say this. God himself doesn't have any obligation to stop evil, nor does he need to. But does this mean that evil is just pointless and that it exists um, without any point whatsoever? Not at all, since, as Tom Aquinas tells us, since God is the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his work unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good even out of evil. This is a part of the infinite goodness of God, that he should allow evil to exist and out of it produce good. This was also the same theodicy St. Augustine provided in his catechism. Since God is all-powerful, he has an infinite amount of time, can God not take any evil in creation and make it into a good? I see no reason not to. In fact, sometimes God's greatest gifts are his curses, funnily enough. This was echoed um, in this small article. Uh, it was an interview with Stephen Colbert. Um, the interviewer asked him if he could help him understand um, a saying he said better. And he described a letter from Tolkien in response to a priest who had questioned about Tolkien's mythos was sufficiently doctrinaire, since it treated death not as a punishment for sin of the fall, but as a gift. This is, of course, um, referring to a certain race that doesn't die, but who's jealous of creatures who can. Tolkien says in a letter back, what punishments of God are not gifts? Colbert knocks his knuckles on the table and says, what punishments of God are not gifts? He says, his eyes were powerful and filled with tears, so it would be ungrateful not to take everything with gratitude. It doesn't mean you want it. I can hold both of these ideas in my head. Any evil that's present within my life is a curse in one sense, but God can always take that and make it better. It doesn't mean that I don't want it to happen, but it doesn't mean I can't be grateful. When Tolkien lost his mother, father, and his brother, rendered an orphan but made into a powerful writer, on the other hand, we have Stephen Colbert, a man who lost his father and his brother on the same day. And yet he was able to take his life as a comedian and be much better for it. So the real 
formulation of the trilemma is if God does not have the will to stop evil, then he's not beloved. Rather, it is since God is benevolent to will the stopping of evil, he will either prevent it or draw from it a greater good. And so the so the aversion from God into non-belief, um, the evidential prom the problems of evil we see day to day, even animal suffering, those particular evils are such that God can even bring out something greater from them, and He is not limited by any lack of power. Animals, especially, I the problem I see specifically with this one is. When it comes to animals, animals generally aren't creatures we have responsibilities or obligations to anyway. Humans have to treat animals nicely, I would argue, because our psyche and our biology and are actually better off when we treat animals with love and kindness. Our nature exists such that it requires it, and it's built on it. It doesn't mean we have any obligations to these animals, but treating them nicely is better for our virtue. God, on the other hand, isn't phased one way or another by when an animal suffers. Um, as for the evil God challenge, the moral argument does sidestep this issue because an evil God doesn't present a benchmark for morality. This was something even Law himself was quick to point out, although he rejects the moral argument. So I don't think it really bears discussing. As for uh, the geographic problem of evil, I believe that God elects who he wills. And he chooses the and he chooses this. And based on it, it is in his will and not mine. And from those who he chooses not to elect, I would say that God, even from um, their rejection of him, can draw even from that a greater good as well. How exactly he does this is unbeknownst to me, since I am not all powerful, nor do I have future uh, sight. But I have faith that it will happen, and it's based on good reason. Oh, by the way, I apologize for uh, not for uh, not addressing everything you said, but, you, you know, limited time. There you go. Okay, so that's Max's first rebuttal. And, Joe, are you ready for your rebuttal? Joe? I think I might have bo uh, bored Joe to death. <laughs> Joe, you around? Here we go. Defeated! <laughs> That's how you win a debate. You make your opponent actually run. <laughs> uh -oh. He's back. <laughs> oh, I didn't know I was that. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm. I'm really sorry. For some reason, it wouldn't. Um, sorry about that. Yep. I hope I didn't mess up the broadcast. It looks like I didn't. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, you can start. Okay, so again, um, so here I want to review Max's arguments and see how they compare with my own. Basically, I do not think that they show that God exists. Uh, Max's major argument was that um, God is, I believe God is necessary for moral, uh, for objective morality, or for a morality that um, is consistent and that we should all, that we should all adopt in order to be moral creatures in the world. I don't think he's de demonstrated that at all. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, if you even this is the same view that Christian philosophers agree as well. For example, uh, Swinburne, uh, Richard Swinburne, uh, has a quote saying, "I don't see any force in a um, argument uh, to God's existence from uh, from morality." Uh, I believe that's like a paraphrase. That's roughly his quote, though. Mm -hmm. I and. Also, I, I believe that Max also has uh, more obligation, uh, not obligations, Max seems to be arguing more for uh, moral obligation. 
the morality system that he is proposing uh, has to do with our obligations, but these obligations are not consistent with the obligations that God has. Because when when we are able to stop people from uh, to stop uh, moral evils or to stop bad things from happening, we um, if we are uh, in the position to stop it, our more we do have a moral obligation to stop those evils, and this is a view consistent with naturalism. Uh, the other issue is. Uh, the other issue with what Max described is his definition of a mind. In order to get around the mind-body problem that I presented, he defined a mind as that which uh, is able to know truth. But I see this uh, answer as just creating more, uh, just um, propagating more questions. Because now I feel that uh, Maximus needs to define what he means by truth, and I believe that which, oh wait, yeah, I feel he needs to define what he means by truth because it's clear that there are minds out there, like uh, children's minds, that are able that at that point are not able to know what truth is. Um, I'm not even sure they can understand the concept of truth. I I think I just need more clarification from Max on that issue if he doesn't mind. Uh, his uh, that also doesn't address the major issue with the mind-body problem, which is that um, we have yet to see any minds existing without, uh, uh, let me repeat, we have yet to see minds that are not either the brain, which is a view that Max actually upholds as a physicalist, nor have we seen minds that are, uh, that exist that are not causally and functionally dependent on a physical brain or a physical body for that matter. So there's no, um, so there seems to be no evidence that at least helps us, uh, you know, it, it seems to not allow us to uh, then jump to the conclusion that there exists a disembodied mind out there. And this disembodied mind also has several different qualities, like the ability to create um, from nothing. Also, this seems to be inconsistent with the view of God's mind specifically, which I, I wouldn't mind if Max would clarify what the Godhead is, which I take to be God's mind, and this, is, uh, this also um, must be linked with two other entities, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Uh, not only is it a disembodied mind that I feel Max needs to defend, but it's a disembodied mind that has the ability to be in two different places and in two different uh, realms, in the, in, up in heaven as the Holy Father and as Jesus Christ when Jesus came down and interacted with us. So let's look at my arguments my um, and see... Uh, to see how Max addressed them, and in looking at my arguments and to see if he addressed them substantially, I'll go over um, the other aspects of Max's um, of Max's case. Uh, his, I already addressed the mind-body problem uh, really quickly, though. That uh, his his explanation it doesn't seem to uh, trump the explanation from naturalism. Um, on naturalism, uh, how, our by, how our minds are formed makes much more sense. Uh, also on Christian theism, it, the fact that we have a brain uh, that has our mind uh, doesn't make sense because God could have just made us with a soul. If, but instead he made us with a brain that takes up uh, so much energy and also makes our head bigger and makes the uh, makes childbirth really really painful for uh, for women and has made it really really painful for all the members of the of Homo sapiens. Um, I also feel like he confused uh, two of my arguments. He confused the argument from divine hiddenness with the argument from evil. These are actually two distinct arguments. One could say that uh, hiddenness is a part of uh, the argument of evil, but I'm not going there. 
I think these are two distinct and powerful arguments. Um, uh, the objections that Max brought up uh, that were uh, related to the um, argument from hiddenness is that he does he does um, concede that there are uh, non-resistant non-believers, but he feels that they are part of God's plan uh, in order to uh, bring people to know God or bring people to accept the gospel message, which is to accept which is to then come into a personal relationship with God. Now, if God desires this, and there are people out there who, through new, who desire a person, who are more than willing, excuse me, there are people out there who are more than willing to come into a personal relationship with God, but don't, then it feels as though God is not meeting his end of the deal. Uh, these people are, God desires a personal relationship with these people, but through no fault of their own, uh, these people are not um, able to come into that relationship with God. Um, this also doesn't make, uh, the, I guess the counter to this that Max brought up also doesn't make sense in light of geographic distribution. He says that um, a geographic uh, distribution, uh, what it does is, um, oh, he says uh, what it does is it allows, uh, non-believers allow uh, believers to come to know God um, in a way that's more, uh, it's a type of uh, coming to know God that God appreciates more. Uh, if this would make sense, then we should have, then we should see uh, the demographics showing people in the middle of uh, countries full of non-believers. We should have a smaller group of people in the, um, that say um, that are theists. And over time, we should see theists slowly taking over this country of non-believers because it is through having these non-believers that more people come to know God. Um, this uh, this is not what we see. Instead, we see that 250 million people in America are theist, whereas uh, over 60 million people in Thailand are non-theist. Uh, what makes uh, the demographics for, of theism make make no sense on uh, God's existence, nor is it really explained by what Max uh, told us earlier. But it makes perfect sense on naturalism. It makes sense that America, which was founded by uh, other, by very sincerely devout people, and uh, um, and established by the Pilgrims, who were Puritans, who were Christians, essentially, it makes sense that that country uh, is populated by theists um, on naturalism. Okay, and. The other thing is, in order to account for the problem of evil, Max has said that, uh, Max has kind of, uh, has talked about ob moral obligations. Essentially, uh, the obligations that God has um, are not the obligations that we have. But at the same time, I feel that Max would, uh, would say that if we saw a little girl um, who was drowning, and we were we both happened to be Olympic swimmers, and were both uh, able to go out and save that little girl from drowning, we would be obligated to save that little girl. And if we decided, if we chose not to save that little girl, then uh, then that would be a moral wrong. That would you know, that would be wrong. Um, but God has obligations that we do not have. Uh, this goes against the idea that God is a person who wants to develop a loving relationship with us. But it also, um, also I feel like the obligations that God has uh, haven't really been presented as... Uh, he, let me start that over. I feel that Maximus hasn't uh, explained why God's obligations are different from ours, and 
and still have that be consistent with what we would see as morally right and morally wrong. How come it's morally wrong for us to not try and save the little girl if she's drowning, but it's morally fine or, or we can't judge God's morality if God doesn't try and save that little girl from drowning? Also, it feels like God is act would is could be considered actively promoting evil as well which uh, you and I are should not actively promote evil we have an obligation to do so but how come God does why does God not have um, an obligation to actively promote evil um, I also feel that uh, moral um, it, I guess Max actually agreed with me that the, at least some moral, uh, at least some evils are better explained on naturalism. Uh, in order to talk about the success of naturalism over Christian theism, is Max says that since naturalism is consistent with his view of Christianity, uh, that's not a problem for Christianity. But I don't know. It seems as though uh, if everything can work on. Um, on naturalism alone, it, it by no means needs God uh, needs God in order to work. Then why posit a God? It it seems like it's less simple, which was uh, an idea that Max brought up earlier. It's more simple to just assume, to um, just work with naturalism, which says that natural processes are behind all these things, whereas uh, the view that Max is supporting also posit that there is a God who doesn't have the same moral obligations as us but is also but happens to be morally good and can be uh, three different entities but also wants to have a personal relationship with us and at one point intervene with the natural world. Why is it that science can um, can work so well without having to worry about this intervention by God? Um, it, uh, it seems like it's adding on an unnecessary caveat to all of our explanations about the world that you don't need. Uh, naturalism explains everything by itself, so why would you need to also add that there is a God? It doesn't add any utility to our explanations. And this is related to uh, my last pithy argument, which is um, if we have no good reasons to think that God exists, that's a good reason to think that God exists. Um, I guess one last thing I should mention on morality uh, is that Max at best is saying that objective morality is required for God or that God is what grounds objective morality. But he hasn't established why objective morality is more um, useful in light of subjective morality. He also... Uh, I'm not sure how, I would like him to explain that a little bit more if he doesn't mind. Because if anything, uh, the God of Christianity is more consistent with a subjective moral framework and, and I think that needs to be addressed as well. Thank you. Okay, Max, are you ready for your last kind of rebuttal? You know it. Okay, you can go. Awesome. So I'm going to start off with the Swinburne quote. Um, Swinburne was talking about grounding objective morality, which I agree with. There are plenty of secular um, frameworks that seem to do a pretty good and consistent job. Uh, everything from moral Platonism to um, neo-Aristotelianism and much more. Uh, social constructivism is another. Um, but I'm not really defending God from the point of view of grounding objective morality as such, but rather showing that if there is objective morality, it requires moral rationality, and moral rationality as a necessary requirement requires justice being done. So uh, the Swinburne quote completely addresses um, type of moral argument very different from mine. Uh, the, diff the notion of truth that I'm using, uh, just to clarify, is a simple correspondence theory of truth, a co uh, something corresponds to reality if um, some sorry something is true if it corresponds to reality. So we have a proposition, and 
therefore to note that um, it is true, it has to have a truth maker, something in reality which um, makes it true as opposed to false. If there is a cat on the mat, then if I say my cat is on the mat currently, that is only true if I have a cat and it is on the mat. For God, he not only is the he not only possesses truth, but he is truth himself, which is to say that God is what makes um, reality correspond to any particular proposition. Um, the third thing is we have yet to see a mind that exists without a brain. Um, and we would expect more of a dualistic image. Well, actually, I think not. A materialistic image seems to work better with Christianity. Not, in fact, it works worse with nat naturalism on naturalism. Uh, what makes it? What is it about having a brain that has evolved that makes it reliable in itself? A brain could a brain could uh, be raised, or could have been conditioned to believe in completely false things just based on the notion that such a brain would have been better off, not uh, uh, for survival, having known a falsehood as being true. Just because something's handy, even for human evolution, doesn't make it true. In fact, many of our beliefs can. Materialism only seems to be a reliable framework when one accepts the Christian God, an immaterial mind, at being the helm of all of this. And also, if the argument I presented is both valid and sound, then it is demonstrated that there is an immaterial mind in existence, namely God, by way of logical demonstration. If, As for the different kinds of moral obligation, yes, God is not obliged by anything to do any particular good um, because God has in Christianity what's called aseity. God is um, above and beyond all things. He is the creator of all things. It says so in the Nicene Creed. And with that in mind, if God is not obliged in the same sense we are, he is more of the obliger. He does not need something else to for his goodness. He is sufficient for his own goodness. Nor does he, and because he's unchangeable and immutable, he doesn't need to develop, and he's already perfect, he doesn't need to develop moral virtues as he goes along like we do. So God has no um, obligation from, from the nature of his being, nor from anything above him that obligates him to act. But he will bring about the good because he is not... Um, doing because he's also perfectly knowing and rational. He would not do something which doesn't ultimately have a point to it or a purpose. And as I said, allowing evil um, in the world to draw about an even greater good is going to show in what way he utilizes the evil which he allows. And this includes everything from uh, the people who um, do not have any knowledge of God, who would not come to a, lo a loving relationship who reject him. Um, and yes, I do consider hiddenness a type of e argument from evil. Um, and I don't really, and I think it can answer it in the same way. Likewise, geographic evil, evidential evil, um, animalistic evil, all possess the all possess the same note because they are working from evil. Just take the um, just take the Euthyphro dilemma, that the structure of that argument, and Tack on instead of evil hiddenness or um, geographic hiddenness and uh, or evident or the evidential problems or animalistic suffering and it works just the same. If we are and also just because we are obliged does not mean also um, just because God does not oblige doesn't mean that we don't have any sufficient moral reason for us to be obliged. We do. We are cre uh, we are obliged to follow God, and we are also and we also have a characteristic or a virtue uh, that needs to be developed. Our virtues are ongoing; they require certain moral conditioning. Um, as for the defense of the Trinity, I I'm pretty sure the outline I gave of it does a pretty good job. Um, God can be at two places at once because while he while his divine nature is eternally present in heaven, his hum when he actualizes the state of affairs in creation, what he's doing is he allow he sustains a human nature which he is perfectly one with that expresses himself perfect 
that express this as being perfectly, as opposed to human beings um, who are not united to God, who just um, who have their own reason, right beliefs, etc., separate of God. Uh, not uh, let's see, um, as for, and that would also defend the incarnation. Um, so I think I've clarified that. Um, and as for the geog and as for the geographic problem, I would also just tie that again into divine hiddenness because one could just rephrase it as why is God hidden from certain people and not others? Uh, why not Thailand? Well, God on the Christian theology that I espouse, God um, elects human beings. God chooses the particular human beings who want a relationship with him. It's n I don't believe in the libertarian free will model or the Arminian model where God himself just um, sits back, pr uh, sends a message out there and sees who responds to it. Further, even other, not only my not only is my theology impenetrable to this criticism, but others are as well. Universalism would just espouse that God is working within each people at their own time. Um, so the divine, the argument from divine hiddenness doesn't really work with either a strong electory model like Calvinists and Augustinians and Thomists, like myself, uh, would accept. Nor to, and nor would even the universalist accept. I think it only poses a problem for people who who have a more Arminian model. Even the open theist who doesn't believe God knows the future could say, well, God didn't know who would come to him. He just left his message out there. So there are various Christian theologies that this doesn't affect. I think it's only problematic for certain Christian theologies, not others. And with that, I would um, allocate the rest of my time to Joe. Okay, Joe, you ready for your last rebuttal? Uh, yeah. Okay, you can start. All right. Um, in this rebuttal, too, I'll also address what Max what Max has said, and then uh, relate it to the arguments that I gave. So far, I still think that my last pithy argument that we, if we have no good reasons to believe that God exists, um, that's a good reason to believe that God does not exist, still holds. He hasn't yet addressed that argument, but I think that the argument still holds because he hasn't addressed a number of the other arguments I said. I, uh, I do not see it being, I do not see his uh, view uh, of physicalism that the mind is dependent, that not the mind is dependent on the brain, the mind is the brain, which is physicalism. Um, I don't see that as being consistent with the view that there exists a disembodied mind. Because if the mind is the brain, then uh, you can't have a disembodied mind because there's no brain for the disembodied mind to be, um, you know, parallel with. It's also not consistent with uh, the slightly uh, more modest contention uh, than physicalism, which is interactionist dualist, which is that the mind is dependent on the existence of a physical brain, because even uh, because that still implies that if there is a mind, there is a physical brain that also has to be there that affects the mind. Uh, these uh, these two views are consistent on naturalism and are demonstrated in the scientific literature, but the view that uh, Max holds in order to justify uh, a disembodied mind, namely God, isn't um, substantiated. At most, he's shown that it's possible that for one to exist, but that's not enough. If he wants to be consistent with his view of physicalism, then uh, he needs to show that it's more than just possible, and he needs to um, rationalize his views with the scientific literature. Um, Speaking of scientific literature, I, I believe, uh, if I didn't mention it already, I'll mention it here, that, it, that the success of naturalism reminds us that science works so well without, without even positing the existence of God. Um, I believe that point hasn't been addressed. And uh, I would be interested to hear what Max has to say on that point. But if he ha doesn't say anything about it, then it should, then it, it feels like that's a given 
which uh, makes it uh, more, uh, which uh, is, makes it more unlikely that God exists. Now, uh, again, I, I do not feel that the um, argument from divine hiddenness is uh, is a subset of the argument uh, of the evidential argument from evil. Uh, for one thing, the evidential argument from evil is an argument of induction. Um, it's that uh, if God exists, then uh, probably pointless evil doesn't exist. Uh, but a lot of pointless evil seems to exist, therefore God probably does not exist, whereas the argument from divine hiddenness is actually a deductive argument, uh, which is something that, I, that uh, Maximus agrees with in his agreement that there are non-resistant non-believers. Uh, it's, it, so it's clear that there exist non-resistant non-believers, that's not something that we need to, um, that we need to um, argue from. And it's clear that if God exists, then he would want to have a personal relationship with, with um, all those non-resistant non-believers. Remember, the reason why it's separate from the, um, the problem of evil, as well, uh, other than being a different type of argument, is that um, divine hidden, hiddenness, a, a, what is, oh, let me say, oh, because it is the case that God doesn't want to, um, doesn't desire a relationship with resisting with certain types of people. Uh, the idea of election was brought up, but it, uh, but the divine hiddenness points out that there are people who are perfectly capable of developing a personal relationship um, with God, but through no uh, but through even in different processes do not develop a personal relationship with God. So. No, um, no call to evil or no call to pain and suffering is required. It certainly doesn't uh, pain and suffering or evil certainly doesn't explain why um, explain the different um, subcategories. I don't see any idea of evil in the fact that our mutual friend Ocean is a pagan. He doesn't. Uh, it seems like he is a great example of a non-resistant non-believer. Um, and I don't see how evil is related to uh, non-resistant non-believers like uh, pagans or like Hindus uh, show some sort of evil that needs to be addressed. So I think those are two separate arguments. Uh, so, um, and I still think that the demographics of theism don't make sense. Um, don't make sense uh, in terms of Christianity. Uh, and the divine hiddenness argument, and I don't think that his um, that Max's a, um, explanation for evil from a, a geographic distribution uh, accounts for the demographics of theism. To add on to the demographics of theism, uh, I guess argument is that not only is theism disproport uh, unevenly um, proportioned around the world. Uh, in ways that make no sense, that make that don't make sense with uh, Christian uh, counters to the divine hiddenness argument, but it's also distributed temporally lopsided. It makes it doesn't make sense that uh, for for almost two hundred thousand years, human uh, humans have lived and died without ever coming to know God, um, and it, and it seems it seems. Uh, Inconsistent with the view of a perfectly loving deity uh, uh, being uh, disinterested in forming a, um, a relationship with people like uh, the people who made up the prehistoric foragers who cannot be considered resistant but still are non believers simply because they were born thousands of years ago and had no concept of God. In terms of his answers to the uh, evidential problem of evil, uh, I'll remind you that the evil God challenge is important because it shows that any any um, response that's given by the theist to the evidential problem of evil can be mirrored and used uh, to support an evil God. So far, um, uh, he said that God is um, that God isn't obligated to. Uh, 
to me, our uh, concept of good, um, uh, but we are due to specific properties of God that he possessed that we do not possess. I can say the same thing about evil God. He's not, ob um, he's not obligated to um, meet, our, um, meet our concept of evil because uh, properties of uh, evil God are different from properties of humans. He also, uh, in re related to this, is his idea of moral obligation, which requires justice. And I think the idea of justice is absolutely um, is absolutely backwards if uh, Christian theism were true, because there is the idea of hell. Hell, to me, is not justice. Hell is eternal punishment for finite crimes. It doesn't seem like it's justice to send someone to hell to to be eternally tortured for all time for uh, things he's done in a finite world. It also doesn't seem like justice to have people who were um, evil their whole lives but then repented at the last minute to get to go to heaven. Both of those things don't sound like justice to me. And finally, I think that this is another type of evil in that it shows that um, if we say that people freely choose to go to hell, I say that a, freely, a person who freely chooses to go to hell is mentally ill. Someone who chooses hell over heaven is mentally ill. And mentally ill people um, need treatment. They need help. They don't need eternal torture. I think that that is an evil and certainly not justice. And so this doesn't really substantiate the type of uh, moral um, argument that Max has presented in order to demonstrate that God exists. This also... Uh, um, in general, the success of naturalism shows that we don't need uh, God to exist, and um, so far we haven't heard any good reasons to think that God exists. Okay, uh, Max, you ready for your closing? Max, you're still muted. You ready for your five-minute closing? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, you can start. Cool. Okay, so this is where the evil God challenge fails. Uh, first of all, God is actually, if he is an evil God, then he is obliged to be evil because he doesn't necessarily possess his own evil. He requires, he, he requires to create other beings to whom he is evil too in order to be called evil. He's not... Um, so, yeah. He and because of this, um, he doesn't really have his own evil. Rather, he requires us, and he is obliged to meet our standards. God, being triune, though, is perfectly loving in himself. He doesn't. Re and last time I checked, uh, triune evil God doesn't really work because he would have to be so hateful and vengeful to the other members that, well, I don't think he'd have enough time to create. Rather, he'd be too focused on himself, his vanity, etc. Um, so, that problem aside, uh, the next problem is when it comes... So, the next problem I'll deal with is the problem of um, hit, uh, justice that was outlined earlier. God doesn't punish people for, not, for being uh, non-believers. Rather, he punishes people for the sins they commit, uh, the lies they tell. No one is, no one is blameless, not one. There are... That is something that has to be taken into account. And finite crimes are not finite when they transgress against the obligations inherent um, in the presence of the infinite. Goodness, even if we don't understand it to be God, is something that we require and use every day. We all have a moral conscience, and yet we transgress against that. When transgressing against the good, we also just happen to transgress against God himself. And any crime against the infinite is no finite crime. And not, and when somebody repents, they are. It is not a mere uh, saying of magic words. Rather, that is grace regenerating the heart of an evil person. That is an evil person dying, becoming new. 
And God, can, who indeed gets this, I do not know. All I know is that in heaven there is also going to be reconciliation. That we, that if we, that we are going to look past our own evils and make it through. When it comes to the argument, when it comes to um, the success of naturalism, which I'll touch on again, there have been times where even naturalistic models have been overtaken by a theistic model. The one I referenced earlier was when the Aristotelian model of causality was overtaken by the um, occasionalist model for causality. As for minds, just because a mind is physical doesn't mean that all minds have to be physical. There are indeed, there can indeed be, it's possible, non-physical minds, and it's not a contrary idea. Likewise, um, if the argument for God an immaterial mind works, then one immaterial mind exists. I have demonstrated it. Um, and the problem would have to be made out with the arguments. As for the premises, they were usually defended by way of paradox, um, the zero-sum argument uh, for the Kantian one, and I think I have defended that well. Although, the uh, one objection I had to how physicalism is harder on naturalism is how are you more, how can you guarantee confidence in a model wherein um, its mechanics are determined by evolution, which is just Bl which is just blind to um, truth itself and rather works to the ends of the survivability of the human being. Survivability does not entail that the human being is going to have true beliefs. It's just that those true beliefs are incidental uh, to um, the being surviving. That's it. Um, so. Materialism poses just as hard, if not a harder problem on the naturalist as it does on the supernaturalist. The supernaturalist, although with the reliability of the mind, can always just point to the fact that there's a, a supernatural guarantor of human reliability. In fact, there are even explanations on the naturalistic model um, that do not really bode well. For example, people have a secret agency detector as the, super, as the naturalist would maintain that provide them what, that make them believe that there are secret agents about on supernaturalism that's explained very easily God makes it apparent that the supernatural exists and that's why we have such a mechanism I end my time thank you okay Joe are you ready for your five minute closing uh, yes I am okay and you can start Okay, well, thank you very much for agreeing to this debate, and um, Max. I really enjoyed myself. Uh, uh, let me conclude by saying that I don't think that Max has um, sufficiently uh, uh, has sufficiently addressed any of the arguments I brought up um, in our uh, in his last speech when he talked about uh, the when he talked about. Um, uh, Material materialism versus uh, supernaturalism. I think that was kind of an incorrect uh, comparison because I'm not necessarily defending materialism here. Uh, again, I mentioned that uh, the point I made about the mind-body problem is consistent with a materialistic view of the mind, and it's not. Um, um, but it's also consistent with interactionist dualism which is uh, not a materialist view, if I, um, if I remember correctly. It's, uh, it seems like uh, much of the answers that we got from Maximus were, at best, retreats to the possible. Some things may be possible, but there's certainly uh, no further evidence of that. We could show a lot of things are possible. Uh, we could show a lot of things are logical. For example, video games. They're internally logical. In video games, we can fly around, we can shoot lasers out of our eyes, and that's logical because in order to make a video game, you need to have logical things occur um, so we can all play them. But they're internally logical. Uh, they make no sense when we look at the real world. They make no sense when we look at naturalism. Um, and uh, they wouldn't, uh, one thing wouldn't transfer to the other. In terms of uh, the evil god challenge, uh, I think uh, the evil god challenge, uh, 
again, I, he uh, referenced the evil God challenge with respect to the Trinity, but not with respect to the other um, issues that I brought up with the evidential problem of evil. That if God exists, then um, uh, then there probably wouldn't be any forms of evil. Uh, yeah, he said that uh, evil God challenge is refuted by the fact that um, um, it doesn't work uh, with respect to the triune uh, with the respect to the triune God because the triune God would be so evil to one another it wouldn't have time to create the world. But evil, remember, evil God wants to maximize evil, so he would create a world where he can cre uh, make all, so many other creatures to be evil too, and also make so many other creatures who are evil as well. That would maximize evil. And so I just want to conclude by summarizing the rest of my points, which I feel were not addressed in this um, debate. Uh, the mind-body problem, again, part of it uh, is the fact that if the mind isn't the brain, then it's heavily dependent on the brain. That last part was not addressed uh, by Max. I also want to talk about uh, the argument from divine hiddenness. Uh, much of what uh, Maximus said doesn't really address, uh, make sense in light of the um, demographics of theism. So in order to elaborate on that point, again, the argument from divine hiddenness is that if God exists, then non-resistant um, non-believers would not exist. But non-resistant non-believers do not uh, do exist. Therefore, God does not exist. Um, again, it wasn't uh, it wasn't argued against that there um, that there clearly are non-resistant non-believers, uh, um, and uh, and it wasn't argued. And uh, at best, it was argued that God would make non-resistant non-believers. But the arguments to uh, support uh, the existence of non-resistant non-believers make no sense on the demographics of theism, because um, it seems uh, inconsistent that there would be millions of believers in one place, but millions of resistant uh, non-believers in another place, and then uh, and then millions of um, theists in the, or non non-believers in another place. These things don't add up with um, with any of the objections to the argument that have been presented. Um, ultimately, I think that this shows that there are no good reasons to believe that God exists. Therefore, we should think that God does not exist, and this is well supported by the fact that naturalism gives better explanations about the world. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mm. So that's the end of our debate between Joe and Max. And I just had to say as a final comment, it's very interesting to watch these debates when you're actually trying to not only moderate it, which is not tremendously interesting, but to actually listen to what everyone is saying and follow what points are addressed and not addressed in each one. It was very interesting uh, to listen to from that respect. And I hope that other people enjoyed it, uh, the exchange, as much as I did. Um, yeah, last night someone was saying that, wow, the 20 minute op openings in the formal setting, uh, you know, people are going to get bored by that. But when you're doing the openings, like time flies. Like, oh. uh, that was the fastest five minutes I've ever experienced, easily. That it was. That it was. <laughs> right? I mean, when you said, uh, when you made your last remark, I'm like, Holy crap! That was five minutes, and I looked at my notes. I wrote maybe one thing. So, <laughs> uh, all right. Are you still uh, down to uh, talk, or? Anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. Um, if anyone wants to come in, we could just post the link in the chat, and uh, we could just discuss, shoot the shit. Yeah, I just posted the link right now. Um, what else? I've been talking for a while, and so have you. What else do you think, uh, Cliff? Yeah, do you want to hear my thoughts on it? Yeah, yes, sure. please. Uh, I'm going to give you some just, just off the top of my head, and I may have missed some things because, like I said, I was trying to write everything down as I was doing. I got a bunch of notes. The thing that I liked about Max's argument was how consistent it was 
and the simplicity of it that he made essentially one structured argument. So it was very easy to follow and it was very coherent from start to finish. The big problem that I had with it was that it sort of just assumed objective morality exists and objective morality requires justice and justice oh. requires a Christian God. That was the part that if I was Joe, I thought would have railed the board right against it. Right. Uh, that's why I usually, that's why I kind of gave those supporting thought experiments in the first one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I tried to hammer home. Although a lot of people tend to shy away from them because for a lot of people, those might just be intuition pumps. Um, but I think, uh, I just still think they held up and... Um, and I thought that they were pretty good. I was especially happy to use my excrement eater um, yeah. analogy that I learned actually from an atheist who is Eric Wielenberg. Uh, you could actually check yeah, out the... Yeah. I like Eric. Yeah. Or, well, I don't know him personally, I should say. I like Wellen... I always call him Wellenberg. Go on with what you're saying. I'm sorry. Oh, right. Uh, from a book that was... <laughs> I find ironic because it was used in a book that was trying to establish how a godless universe can indeed have virtue and morality. Um, which was something that um, I, I don't agree with him on, uh, you know, for the sake, for the justice factor, but I think that his book was indispensable, at least for the first premise. And the other part that I liked about what Max did was you dealt with almost, uh, you did the, the Joe's argument from naturalism was so dealt with so succinctly when you basically said under Christianity we would expect naturalism to work because God would make the universe in a way that we would be expected to understand it. Mm -hmm. Therefore you would expect to see naturalism. I thought that was done really well. And the way that you, now Joe had some contention with it, but I liked the way that you was simply addressed all of the arguments that he was bringing up as some kind of evil in the case that God doesn't bring everyone to him or whatever it was and you made a kind of basically, well, we can't know 100% what God is and the reason, the reason why we see these things, it just could be uh, because God has some sufficient reason. And then you dealt with the evil God challenge right away by saying, yes, you can usually counter that with evil God and saying everything that I'm saying, you can say, well, doesn't that prove evil God? But you immediately said, but evil God wouldn't satisfy the morality argument, which is why I made, so I can reject the evil God challenge. I thought, oh, the, yeah, yeah, I thought the first rebuttal was really well. Oh, and I, I actually have to say something about Joe's presentation that I really loved. The fact that he actually brought up objections present in the philosophy of religion literature. That is so refreshing. Um, like, I absolutely love the fact that you also brought up Schellenberg. He's, he was my philosophy professor at university, so I'm always yeah. happy to see his argument come about. That's the most persuasive argument, I think, uh, the argument mm -hmm. from divine hindedness. Um, it is. It's actually yeah. what forced me to be a it's actually what forced me to reject my more Arminian uh, framework and accept, uh, and I'm using Protestant terminology here because more people are familiar with it. It rejected, it made me reject the kind of Arminian framework where people freely choose God and accept more of a Calvinistic like framework where God elects. Mm, so, yeah, when you yeah. said that, I wasn't, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like, elect, I, I, I thought that's more refrain, uh, reformed. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't uh, expecting that. Yeah, I, I'm an Augustinian by background. Uh, I differentiate Augustinianism from Calvinism in a few details, mostly to help it fit with my Catholic theology. Uh, I see. Yeah, I mean, that was the... Di I mean, especially when I watched your, uh, your video that shows the different types of apologetics is... I, I, I would say it's perfect, but for some reason, the volume is super low on it. I had to have it at full volume. So, uh, but other than that, everything was. It was great to hear. I like the way you explained a different type of apologetic approaches. And when you said that Swinburne was the one that you are, uh, that you like, I was like, but I like Swinburne. He's great. Um, yeah. So it was again. It was difficult trying to. Uh, prepare for the type of arguments mm -hmm. that you would give because uh, because of just how much overlap and because of just how much agreement we have uh, right. I, I think yeah I mean my I have friends who are, come from a variety of backgrounds um, I have friends who are presuppositionalist I don't defend presuppositional apologetics because um, I don't I have never met someone who was persuaded uh, into who was uh, persuaded um, 
by Christian doctrine by way of apologetical uh, presuppositional doc uh, uh, methods. It's it's a good defense of the Christian. It works as a good defense of the Christian faith, but I don't think it makes people question their own uh, beliefs um, because I actually for, when I practice apologetics, my philosophy is if you can't if it's your apologetic isn't ultimately going to uh, bring forth the Holy Spirit to move them to grace, then it's at least going to have people who are more refined in their thinking and when reflecting on their own philosophical viewpoints. So I think if it's not going to do the believer, the non-believer any good by way of bringing them to Christianity, then it's going to do them at least some good in, in their own personal lives. And I think that if you can strive to bring them to Christianity, at least strive to bring them to some kind of Socratic method of discourse. Yeah. It's always good if you make someone more reasonable than they once were. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, just to make a few comments, Joe, on uh, your presentation, um, the closing, the same as you did with Nephilim Free, was really strong. And I think the closing is often the most important part of the debate because it's generally people remember the first of what you say and the last of what you say. And mm -hmm. since it's so short, it's usually what people pay the most attention to. People often will zone out during the 20 minutes, but yeah. the five minutes of some fast, they'll, they'll zoom in on it. But the other thing that I will say is that it was very nice to see how close you were paying attention to Max and you picked up on some things that I didn't even catch right away. So Max said something like, a mind is a thing which can recognize truth and immediately you came back with a counter and I don't know if Max addressed this and is not, I was listening to see, but you said, well, if a mind is a thing that recognizes truth, then children don't have minds because they don't recognize truth. Oh, and like you came up with that counter example right away as he was saying it, like that was really impressive the way you provided like almost spontaneous uh, counterexamples. Yeah. Uh, man, if I had more than five minutes, I, I would have probably addressed that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the issue with this. I, I mean, uh, maybe you would like this if you're, uh, you know, Reasonable Doubts? Oh, uh, my, Justin Schieber is a friend of mine, yeah. I, I was going to say, you do know Justin Schieber. Uh, you know that they, they released a couple of... Uh, debates that were, you know, extended debates. People released presentations and uh, then they got a week to respond to them and then they ultimately uh, took all the audio recordings of the debate and made them into one debate back to back. Uh, that makes it so much easier to actually respond. I mean, you can, can articulate, you have time to prepare a presentation. If you want to do that too in the future, I'm down. Oh, I think yeah. yeah, I think that's really cool. Like from an academic point of view, yeah. But like, cause, but it, but if that's what you're doing, it's just a series of lectures, like one after another. But like in this, it's really interesting to see people react like on the fly and come up with arguments and go right back and forth. Like to me, like I would not be typically very interested to watch like one lecture after another lecture. Like in that, it wouldn't even seem to me like a kind of like it'd be interesting to watch a series of lectures, but like mm -hmm. it, to me, the dynamic of going back and forth was like really interesting, like to sort of watch like lectures I just bookmark and watch, like sort of whenever. You know, you're right. Uh, some of those are they're pretty dense, um, but uh, and also there was one between uh, JJ Louder and uh, someone named Kevin Vandergriff. And I don't think this was cheating or anything, but in order to make all his points, uh, Vandergriff sped up his last five minutes. He he recorded it, and then he he like uh, made it go faster in order to <laughs> fit <the> five minutes. <laughs> and, and like, uh, That's kind of I funny. Don't, I mean, again, I don't you know if uh, JJ Louder didn't have a problem with it and he said, I don't think it's cheating but uh, I think he knew that uh, you know, that doesn't matter because it makes it kind of weird it, it's kind of weird, it made you guys laugh but also, uh, you know I don't even, I didn't even process what he said because I'm like, is he really talking that fast and then okay, he sped up what he said and it you know, it took away from his presentation. Uh, he's trying to make it more uh, content dense, but instead, you couldn't get any content out of it because it sounded like it would have been funny if, uh, in accidentally speeding it up, he also made his voice sound like he was a chipmunk. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, if that's how you sped something up, it's like, well, actually, I disagree because. Blah, 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 blah. 
<laughs> if that happened, but it it was off putting, and um, oh, what is it? But yeah, I think that it still makes it better having a even if it's a series, even if it ends up sounding like a series of lectures. It's interesting to have the back and forth. I'll get bored if I'm only hearing someone saying something I agree with after a while. Uh, I think the really interesting thing would be to watch a very similar debate between you and Max, say, two weeks from now. Because now you're responding on the fly. Like, Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, Lawrence Krauss and William Lane Craig had this where they debated right after each other, like in a bunch of. Yeah. And I was like, why did they pick Lawrence Krauss? Exactly. Like, I like the I guy when he's talking about physics, but when he's talking about like Christianity or morality or anything, he's just really dumb. Like in the stuff oh. that he says, like there's interesting people that could have debated uh, yeah. uh, William Lane Craig, and those people having debates right after another, like, uh, does a Christian God exist? Is it reasonable to uh, to believe in the Christian God? These would have been interesting things. They could have staggered one after another, or even they could have took, for example, William Lane Craig uh, debating someone on Islam, William Lane Craig debating someone uh, from from an atheist position, and you might have even had this to stagger. It would have been kind of interesting to see as a series of debates, maybe. But yeah. that one I wasn't interested in after the first one. I don't think I watched the rest of them. Uh, of all the people, yeah, why Lawrence Krauss? And Lawrence Krauss was also a jerk the whole time. Uh, like, oh, yeah. I mean, in the horrible. first debate, I didn't watch it, but uh, I listened to... Um, or he, had I read a, the, he had a buzzer where anytime he's... Like, the bullshit buzzer. Oh, Craig, speaking bullshit, man. Like, I was like, rude much. That is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ugh, but uh, Cliff is right. It's such a bummer. He uh, William Lane Craig has debated people who were were just great. And why is it of all these people, Lawrence Krauss is who he debates? Like technically, I think it's actually it's like four times, if not three. One of the people who was moderating one of the debates was Graham Oppie. Graham Oppie is a uh, like his books are on. Um, uh, atheism, and they're amazing. He's a great. Uh, it's like I don't even care if Graham Oppie doesn't have like a debate uh, background. I would rather have uh, one debate between Graham Oppie, who knows the stuff and who isn't just, I guess, obnoxious like Lawrence Krauss, than have the three debates with Lawrence. Ugh. Lawrence Krauss also didn't even. He didn't even address the physics well. That's the part. Like, if I was Lawrence Krauss and I was picking a topic, I'd debate on the Kalam cosmological argument. That's the, yeah. like, because Craig uses it a lot, and I would have said, okay, let's debate this. And it's, it's a Kalam cosmological argument, right? And a it's good also argument. Very and it's also very physics intensive, so it would be right up Craig's yeah. uh, alley. In fact, Sean Carroll talked yeah. about the fine tuning argument and the Kalam, because that's something he knows about. And I really. Like Sean Carroll was smart enough not to choose something like morality because I'm not sure, because he's pretty much not a moral philosopher. Mm. Um, I think Shelley Kagan, it, Shelley Kagan's a moral philosopher, and he did well yeah. when he when that topic was brought up. Yeah. But yeah, stick to your strengths, and I think that works for people. I yeah, wish that would have been another great one indeed. Yeah, if he had to debate the fine tuning argument as well, like Lawrence Krauss, he had an excellent point. Max. You know what sucks though is that Sean. I wish it was Sean Carroll instead. Uh, the the Sean Carroll William Lane Craig debate was great. It's uh, I mean I was just surprised. I never even heard of Sean Carroll before that, and Sean Carroll I think did an excellent job. But it's such a bummer that the debate really did get into some technical stuff, uh, like uh, Boltzmann brain problems, uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, it's just I wish. What I wish that yeah Lawrence Krauss did that kind of debate, and I think Sean Carroll could have. Uh, he could have done a debate uh, that w was uh, theism versus naturalism. That probably would have been just an awesome debate because uh, Sean Carroll does write about um, atheism, and he also, I think, uh, his minor at least was philosophy. Uh, so he's not like Lawrence Krauss, who I mean, that's the other thing to think that someone who has a doctorate, to think that someone who is as smart as Lawrence Krauss is also someone who goes, eh, I think philosophy's worthless. Like, that sounds like a... Sounds like a... It... 
I don't know. It sounds really dumb, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, he has no training in philosophy at all. So why would you even care? It's like um, uh, Feynman, right, has a famous quote that I always thought was funny. He said, a scientist talking about non-scientific things is just as dumb as the next guy. So why would you care what he said? Like, and why would he even make a statement? It's like so dumb. It's like asking me something about medicine. Like, why would you ask me about it? Right? I just thought it, I just thought it was really bad. But I agree with Joe. Like, Lawrence Krauss did not even uh, deal with the things that he should have dealt with really well. Like, uh, Craig made an argument about um, infinities, and I was just like, okay, Lawrence Krauss is going to take this apart. Because Craig is like, oh, infinities can't exist, blah, 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 blah. And Lawrence Krauss's only rebuttal was, well, math's kind of strange. Do you know what the summation of all the natural numbers are from, like, 1 to infinity? Minus 1 over 12. Ha, ha. That's kind of weird, too. And I was like, okay, that's disingenuous because the summation that leads to negative 1 over 12 is not a Riemann sum. It's another formulation, so it's not what people mean when they say summing it up. That's a disingenuous mark. And you just basically made like a sort of God is mysterious argument. You just said math is mysterious. Like, that's really bad. That's, that is. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, the guy also denies classical logic as a way to... Uh, stop Craig's arguments, which is kind of funny. Um, there's a, I mean, he said, there are such things as squared circles. It's just when a circle is really small. And he also says 2 plus 2 equals 5. If the, the large if, value is 2. If, which, of course, yeah, if you have like 2.5 plus 2.5, of course it's going to be 5. Um, the classical logical allows this. And um, he also says, well, probability theory shows that quantum mechanics um, has, quantum mechanics shows probability theory is wrong. And Craig responded by saying, saying that is kind of like saying, well, my checkbook's not adding up. Math is just incorrect. He, he, he makes that the, isn't the squared circle, can't that also still be valued by saying it's the definition of a circle uh, is not equal to the definition of a square. Uh, that's why a squared circle is used as an example so much. It's mm -hmm. it's not that, and, and also, what is it, 2 plus 2 equals 5, a, that's still, is very... <laughs> like, that's a joke, right? And I can't, I couldn't believe Lawrence Krauss brought that up. Like, when you first learn limits, one of the things you understand yeah. about calculus is that equals doesn't actually mean the same thing. It means approaching. Yeah. So when you say, like, 1 equals 1, the, the common understanding of the equal sign is that the things are identical. It's the same thing. Later on, when you start doing it, you realize that's not what the equal sign actually means in mathematics. So that joke, that's that shirt comes from somebody making that joke that 2 plus 2 equals 5 for sufficiently large values of 2. It's just a joke, but he used it like seriously and I was like, dude, that's a joke. It's yeah. not actually true. Like That's not real math. What is, as as what x uh, approaches affinity, or the limit of uh, as x approaches uh, infinity, uh, you could say, I don't... Uh, it's been a while since I've done calculus. Well, like the, the, where it comes out of, if you like, so what's 1 over 3, right? 1 over 3 is 0 0.3 repeating, yeah. right? So what's 1 over 3 times 3? 1. What's 0 0.3 repeating? 0 0.999999. So 1 equals 0 0.99999, right? So that's what that means. So for sufficiently large values of 0.999, yeah. it equals 1. So that's where the joke comes from, right? So the first time someone said that, someone put it on a t-shirt. Oh, yeah, well, then. 2 plus 2 equals 5 for severely hard. But it's not actually true. It's someone making a joke. And you said it like it's a real thing. Like, yeah, and I was what, like, what the hell? What's really funny, though, is uh, Craig, he said that in response to Craig saying, well, look, according to Michael Roos says, um, raping a child is as wrong as 2 plus 2 equals 5. And then Krauss stripped up <laughs> in his shirt. Yeah. So, okay, so there might be ca sufficiently large <laughs> cases where raping babies is okay. Yeah. <laughs> for, for sufficiently good values of rape? Like, what was the point of that? Sufficiently yeah, good values. Oh, really? uh, that's, that's pretty. And what sucks is I think that Stephen Law, fine. Uh, William Lane Craig's been giving that Michael Roos, uh, or giving a Michael Roos um, quote for over a decade, uh, the same one. And it was so great hearing Stephen Law just, I mean, he's like, well, well, yeah, uh, 
I would have agreed with you that that's not a good moral theory. You can't just ru- it was he was like you can't rubbish one bad moral theory and then say therefore uh, divine command theory works. Uh, the onus is on you to show the I mean uh, the show that all these other moral theories uh, don't work and like. Yeah, in the debate, it would be lame to think that Craig has to go through every single uh, non-divine command theory to sh- uh, to finally show that divine command theory works. But at least like attack the the better arguments or and um, and uh, the uh, the argument from evolution that I think Ruse de- doesn't uphold either. Um, that's not the best argument uh, atheism has. That's not the it best is argument. A popular one, though. It is a very popular one. Like people bring it up all the time. Yes. Yeah. It. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not even a divine command theorist myself. I'm actually a virtue. Uh, funny enough, I'm, my own position is um, a natural law theory, which actually has its roots in um, Aristotle and also Cicero but was adapted by Jewish and Christian theologians, both Thomas Aquinas as a Christian example, and Moses Maimonides, Jewish example. Um, you know what, you, you brought up, uh, there's one point you brought up that I, I just thought of, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I should probably write it down because I'm interested um, in what you said about it in the debate. But yeah, I knew you weren't a divine command theorist, and again, like, uh, well, I guess not recently, but a month ago, all I was doing was looking up the arguments against divine command theory. And the first person to officially go, yeah, let's have a, a formal debate is someone who, again, doesn't, who I agree with on lots of things. Uh, I knew you'd get a kick out of the, of the Swinburne quote, uh, oh. by the way. Oh. Um, yeah, I... I remember when Phil Fernandez uh, was advocating uh, God for more for the existence of morality, and uh, through divine command theory. And I, I don't remember the name of the atheist debater, but he actually brought up this Swinburne quote just like you did. Um, although I'm, I think I'm a better debater than Phil Fernandez, at least uh, on this argument. Uh, but yeah, I, I was prepared for it. I'm trying to remember. Oh, Jeff, uh, Jeff yeah, Louder. It's louder. Yeah, louder. Jeff J. Louder. And that's what's the bummer with Jeffrey J. Louder is it I can agree that he's he probably is a good debater, but his only uh, especially uh, his only public debate example is against Phil Fernandez, who is not a good debater at all. And uh, I wish that Jeffrey J. Louder would debate more because. It sucks that people like Lawrence Krauss are yeah. getting the chance to debate William uh, Lane Craig. I, I blame William Lane Craig for that, by the way. William Lane Craig could have accepted a debate challenge from Jeffrey J. Lauder. In fact, it's been offered for years, mm-hmm. but he keeps putting it off, saying, well, no, I'm going to reject this because the guy doesn't have a PhD. Yeah, that's of, what he of course, neither did Christopher Hitchens, but <laughs> we, allowed that, we allowed for that one. Yeah. I mean, it, the same could be said for... Uh, John Loftus too, but I don't think John Loftus is a good debater. I would rather see Craig debate louder. And it's, uh, did you see recently? Louder posted a letter to William Blake Craig, and he's like, ten years ago, you said it would be cool to debate." And I, I mean, I don't uh, understand it. Louder has clout in the community. Uh, uh, he's kind of an ass, though. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say kind of. He is an ass. Um, is he? Oh, he is a major asshole. Uh, I have friends of the atheist community who keep telling me this. It, it's quite funny. The guy thinks uh, the guy has characterized himself as uh, what's his name? Michael Borgeson, uh, the the guy who made the atheist manual. Oh, uh, Peter something. Peter Bor, yeah, uh, Tim, and he's just been defending him nonstop. He. Um, he criticized a few uh, counter apologists because they're using, um, because they're reading and participating in the philosophy of religion literature, which Loftus and uh, Peter de- de just said is the philosophical equivalent of the kids' table. Which, uh, which of course, uh, by the way, I consider 
uh, Peter to be uh, not a smart person. Um, but yeah, he's Loftus is also a drunk. Um, he is a douche and a drunk. A douche and a drunk. Yeah, he he's also somebody who criticized. He also criticized Jeffrey J. Louder for criticizing uh, Peter by saying, "Well, Jeffrey, you can't speak. You don't have a PhD." Why um, am I the whole time right now? I thought you were talking about Louder. No, oh no. I'm like, no, no, how Loftus. is Louder an asshole? Loftus. Is Loftus is an asshole. Yes, I agree there. Loftus, yes. what? Uh, uh, everything I spoke was about Loftus, not Louder. No, yeah, Louder. Yeah. Sorry, no. I can use that. No, Louder's. I respect Louder. Yeah. Uh, Loftus, on the other hand, is uh, the person I was saying is a drunk. He's also a <laughs> douche. And uh, yeah, the, the, and yeah, he criticizes people who, who don't have PhDs. He's he's so he's so thin-skinned too. Like uh, when a while ago uh, on Common Sense Atheism, uh, Luke Muehlhauser said, "Look, William Lane Craig is a persuasive debater. Uh, all these people who think they can debate him, you guys haven't shown us that you are." Uh, that you can actually put up a fight against Craig, and uh, one of the people was was um, John Loftus, and John Loftus was just like, "So you're saying I shouldn't debate him?" So and it's like, "Look, you can, but you should prepare more. You really should." And then also Loftus does have debates, and when you listen to them, he doesn't hold up well. He debated uh, David Wood, I believe, on the Resurrection last year, and oh yeah. How do you not beat David Wood? I could take yeah. a PhD's position and beat David Wood. David, he's a great. Yeah. Mus- he's great with Muslims. I love David on mu- Islam, but he's not really good with atheists. He, yeah, he actually doesn't have a lot with atheists. Uh, that's the other thing with David Wood is uh, the only uh, non, non, uh, I guess, a uh, resurrection or um, uh, debate that he's had with atheists was against, I forget her name, but she's... Hannah from, Dadaboy. Yeah, was against her. And uh, I started watching it. I thought she did, and I still thought she did well. Um, but I, I need to watch the rest of it before I can say. I think that she kind of was all over the place. Uh, she she more, she more slipped into how awesome is, uh, you know, like science and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. And, Sci- uh yeah, I, I don't think science fanboyism tends to make a good or persuasive argument to Christians. No, especially if, I mean, you have someone like William Lane Craig coming up and talking about cosmology, talking about uh, how his arguments are relevant to the cosmological literature, and then you have the whole time, Lawrence Cross was also, and I'll say something about fine-tuning in a minute, and like William Lane Craig kept on saying, we keep on hearing we're gonna uh, we're gonna find out about uh, fine tuning. Hopefully, he'll eventually tell us what he thinks about fine tuning. Um, I don't know. Uh, By the way, Max, have you ever gone into M's rooms? He's been opening hangouts lately. Oh yeah, from time I've been in a couple of them. Um, nice guy. Yeah, because he wants to talk to some Christians about uh, various things, and unfortunately, the only Christians going in there are not overly intelligent, like. Uh, Evolution Falls has been going in there an awful lot. Oh, <laughs> man. Evolution Falls. Like, I would love to... I've engaged with that guy before. He does not... I, I, I argued in defense of compatibilist free will against libertarian free will from scripture. He did not answer my argument at all. I he said, doesn't. look... It, yeah, he doesn't. I said, okay, look, it says in Second Corinthians um, that there is nothing that we have that isn't given us, to us by God. On libertarian free will, however, we could just respond to Paul by saying, well, no, Paul, libertarian free will exists on this viewpoint. Um, all the potential that any free choice that we have made for ourselves, no, that's all us. God doesn't give us that. We get to choose it. And we get to choose what we get to do with all the materials that God gives us. So everything I have get given is given from me. There, um, And by the way, the scripture says, there is nothing that uh, you have that you have not received. So I think that would even encapsulate our our choices as well. And I would defend a compatibilist approach as opposed to a libertarian one for that. 
he had some really weird. I want, he's one of the only people I've ever seen bring up this argument. He was running some kind of presup, and uh, Floyd came in, who hates presuppositional arguments. I hate them too. And and Floyd basically said, no, you don't need to have the Christian God. You can start off with some kind of properly basic beliefs and build up a foundational theory of knowledge for that. And evolution falls is like, well, what are your properly basic beliefs? He tells him, and he was like, well, how do you justify your properly basic beliefs? And Floyd is like, <laughs> well, you don't. Be, that's what it means to be, you know, you can't justify a properly basic belief. If you could justify it, it wouldn't be a properly basic belief. And he's like, no, if you can't justify it, you can't hold it as a properly basic belief. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. Do you know what a properly basic belief is? He, when, uh, when I was, he said that, uh, well, I think actually if you listen to our debate, I talked to him about creationism. If you listen to our debate, I think uh, when I asked him, like, are you a younger creationist, he said yes. And so when I started running the argument that I used against younger creationism, he just was like, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. And it's like, well, you said you're a younger creationist, so you, you agree with uh, Ken Ham or um, ICR. And he's like, no, no, you need, to, you, you need to go with what the Bible says. And it's like, so I have to go and count up all the different ages myself to you? How come I can't, I mean... Just ask is, you. Like, I did, and he's like, I don't know how old. The earth is. It was really funny. Like whenever Joe decided to cite something from any kind of creationist resource, he was like, "No, you have to do all the math yourself because I don't trust that resource." And it's like, and I could, I tried to make the point clear, which is another. I mean, which is why I try to argue with creationists by sticking within their um, within their paradigm by using their work is that. The people who support it, they don't know anything about what uh, creationists actually say. Uh, they don't know what um, Henry Morris actually says about things. They don't know what John Morris actually says. They don't know what Ken Ham actually says about things. When you say, well, uh, I, well uh, they think that um, after, uh, only 100 years after the flood, we were able to get the mastodon, and then we were able to get the woolly mammoth, and then we were able to get the two different types of elephants, and they were all able to spread out to America, uh, all within uh, starting from a hundred years after the, the flood, and uh, before uh, three hundred and fifty years after the flood. So, in two hundred and fifty years, uh, the elephant kind uh, turned into four different elephants, or at least three different uh, elephant kinds, and also was in America. I mean, it's important you... And when I bring that up, they're like, I never said that. I, I don't think that. I never said that. And it's like, okay, you want this stuff to be taught in the schools? You're going to want your best people to write the stuff that's going to be taught in schools. And the best people on your side, they're the ones who said that crazy, stupid thing. Yeah, because uh, all he'll say is, I don't know. Like, you know, how many kinds, I don't know. And then he'll point to a list, well, I mean, the creations, well, I don't trust the creations, literally. I don't know yeah. how many kinds are on the ark. I don't know when this thing happened. I don't know when the Tower of Babel was. I don't know what the Tower of Babel is. I don't know, I don't know. Oh, so, so you don't know anything. So when, when we have a write a textbook, if you're the one that writes it, it's like creationists, I don't know, is the answer to all of these things. Uh, ask him if he thinks, ask him about the flood. I mean, come on. If That's he, what I like, does he believe the flood was worldwide? Yes. Okay, so he does know that. Yeah, in that case, <laughs> feel free to go nuts because that is perhaps the flood narrative is the hardest in the young Earth paradigm to defend. Um, I do not know how one goes about defending a a, a flood on the universe on the young Earth account. I uh, I debated Neff on it, and I actually I don't I mean I think I won that technically. But uh, the debate was a little weird, and I messed up on the on the um, cross examination section. The the thing with Nephilim is he just makes up stuff, yeah. and he, he makes up such a large amount of stuff. Like, and you have to know a large amount of stuff to figure out what he's making up, because he will just make up stuff like wide scale, and you have to be able to counter all of this 
stuff. Like normally when, you, when you're debating, like you're not like that. People are just not going to start saying crazy stuff, but he will. So like that's how he just makes shit up. Uh, I remember him. Uh, one of the funniest recordings a friend of mine ever got of Nephilim Free was when he said, "Experiencing God is like being in a dark room and experiencing Maydays." <laughs> Mayday. <What? laughs> oh, yes, like that is an actual recording my friend Shadow Heathens has. It is hysterical. So he there's has been a in a dark room rubbing himself over with mayonnaise is what he's, he's saying. There's That's a video you have where he's <laughs> on you, and I had to. I really had to try to not just watch that video. I'm like, I have to prepare for the debate. I can't just start watching all the weird videos of Neff. Uh, in a, oh, that's in that's one of the wild. debates I have with him, uh, he 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 agreed with uh, the, a uh, Christian university's decision to um, prohibit interracial dating. Uh, I brought that up to him, and he's like, "I don't see any problem with that." And uh, like people, like I didn't know how to respond to that. I thought he would say. Well, they're not true Christians or something like that. I didn't know he would actually go. No, no I don't see anything wrong with prohibiting interracial dating. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, like, like they all came from specific people, right? All the races yeah. of man are from the original like descendants. Did, did he? He at makes least... this big argument. Like, and I've always wanted Ocean to be in the room where he starts ranting out. Well, historically, this dude, this dude, and these tribes, and just like, and again, he's just making shit up on scale. But if you don't know the history to counter it. Oh, I should also uh, ask about that, though. When he was defending that, was he at least caveating with, well, they're a private Christian institution, and and I think private institutions should be allowed to, to do as they no, see fit. he didn't fit even as do that. That would have been the better answer. Um, oh. Even, yeah. So he thinks there's something morally wrong with uh, interracial dating. Well, he's like, I, I don't see a problem with people, uh, with a black person, you know, dating a, dating a white person and them having children. I, they're good for them. They're doing what God wants. But there's nothing wrong with wanting to keep the different, you know, tribes of man separate. Yeah, <laughs> and, tribes of man. That's what oh, is. fuck. Yeah, that, yeah, that is some um, uh, definite yeah. racism. Yeah. yeah, like not, <laughs> it's not even a hint, right? <laughs> <laughs> at, at that point, all I did was this face. I was just like, and I know that people don't always look in the panel at the different faces, so I did it for a long time because so people so it would make it more likely that people saw me doing that. And uh, for Han, who was in the room, he's like. Joe, I screen capped your face when you made that face. I was, I was just sitting there. Oh God, I was just like. Does he deny that now, or does he still? Will he still say the same thing? I haven't. I haven't brought it up with him because, in part, because I was trying to put together a um, kind of like a. I guess it kind of got bigger, but I was trying to put together a presentation for a debate, uh, <laughs> but. Which is more, uh, which is racist, uh, creationism or evolution? But um, yeah, because he was on that for a while. Yeah, because I I think that well, one thing uh, a lot of people don't realize. Uh, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that creationism is very very racist, and uh, people have used uh, Christianity to push racist agendas. People have used evolution to push racist agendas. Um, uh, they view, but I think that if uh, creationism wants to be a legit science, we compare creation to uh, creation science to evolution, not Christianity to uh, evolution. And so it's perfectly yeah. fine to say that creationism is racist, but uh, also not saying um, not saying that uh, Christianity. I think with, with Nephilim, often he says like stupid stuff, and, and like later he realizes how stupid it was, and he pretends he never ever said it. Yeah. Oh, there's that hangout about the elephant thing, right? Yeah. There's he, also uh, yeah. also try bringing up the fact that he uh, he. Um, the escorts on the bookmark. That's <laughs> I have brought that up to him. He is always he called me a liar. 
Oh wow! He denies it happened. No. He no. denies. Uh. He also hit on me once. Yeah, that's what. Nice. Uh, I, I, I haven't watched it yet because I'm like I need to prepare for this debate. I can't watch. He hit on you. That's awesome. <laughs> it's hilarious. He is now. It's like, is he drunk right now? I don't know because there was that one the other night. He came into a room really, really drunk. Oh, and, he was uh, wasted. I was not there, but I heard. He's all like, "So you guys aren't gonna let me talk. You're not gonna be." He got the. I guess when he's drunk, instead of saying mature, he says mature. <laughs> well, Gus was there, and Gus just started repeating shit back to him in the same drunk way Neff was talking. <laughs> I was he's like, like really. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yep, evolutionist. It's like, Neff, you need to drink a lot of water so you don't get dehydrated <laughs> and just accept the fact that you're going to have a huge headache tomorrow. But don't go on Google Hangout right now. All right. Um, yeah, this is the reason why I don't host my own Hangouts because I randomly will just be like, I don't want to sit at the computer right now and just want to leave. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop unless you guys want. Well, I guess I can I can leave and you guys can still talk. Um, uh, actually, cool, I got some stuff to do anyway. Sam, yeah. I gotta get something to eat. I just I literally woke up 20 minutes before. Uh, well, not 20, uh, like 40 minutes before the debate. I have a night job, which is why I keep things at night uh, relative to where I am. Oh man. Well, I mean. What is it? You should go into Nadia's room a lot more, and like uh, like Cliff said, go into Cl uh, M's room a lot more, because the only people we had to deal with are people like Evolution False. It would be nicer to hear a bit more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, look, if you're ever in one of M's room, if you're in M's room and there's room and Evolution False is there, just just message me on Facebook. Just do that every time. Oh man, that would be like, awesome. If I <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, okay. Again, thank you guys for this. That was a lot of fun, you guys. Yeah, yeah. and it was cool to so, watch, man. All right, take care. Later.